Now it is my great privilege to welcome our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Julie Morita, to the 2017 UIC School of Public Health commencement. A graduate of the UIC College of Medicine, Dr. Morita had, has previously worked in private practice and as an epidemi epidemic intelligence officer for the Centers for Disease Control. Dr. Morita then joined the Chicago Department of Public Health to serve as chief medical officer. In that role, she led the city's response to the pandemic influenza outbreak, where she developed a system to distribute more than one million doses of vaccine across the city, as well as the city's efforts to prevent the introduction and spread of the Ebola virus. In 2015, Dr. Morita was appointed commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. Under her leadership, CDPH has developed and launched Healthy Chicago 2.0, a four-year plan to assure health equity by addressing the social determinants of health. In addition, CDPH led efforts to pass several tobacco prevention initiatives, including raising the age for purchasing tobacco products to 21 years. This January, Dr. Morita was integral in forming a 10-year progressive partnership between CDPH and the UIC School of Public Health. This partnership will form the first academic health department aimed at improving public health in Chicago. Early goals of the academic health department include facilitating collaboration on educational programs for students and public health workers, fostering collaborative research and grant opportunities, and forming a sustainable infrastructure for project implementation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Morita. Good afternoon. Chancellor Emeritus, Trustee Fitzgerald, Dean Conroy, and former Dean Brandt Ralph, thank you for inviting me to speak at this momentous occasion. It's an honor to be here, both as a Chicago native, a UIC alumna, and especially because the Chicago Department of Public Health established our first academic health department agreement with the University of Illinois School of Public Health earlier this year. In the next 10 minutes, or maybe 11, I'm going to do four things. I will congratulate you, I will thank you and your loved ones, and I will share a personal story with you, and most of all, I hope to inspire you. So let's get started. You made it, and that's really a big deal. It wasn't easy, it wasn't always fun, and many of you managed your classes, your capstone projects, and long commutes in addition to holding jobs, raising families, and being active in your communities. Congratulations. Now I want to thank you for choosing a public health career. Public health needs a strong workforce, ready to tackle emerging and re-emerging threats, like Zika virus and the heroin crisis, along with health disparities in life expectancy HIV, and infant mortality, which continue to plague our city, our state, and our nation. Thank you for stepping forward to address these challenges. We need your help. To your family members and friends, thank you too for your support emotionally, physically, and maybe financially. When I was first asked to speak, I wondered what could I say to you, the students, soon to be graduates, you haven't already learned. After several hours of perusing great speeches and reviewing hundreds of platitudes, I decided to tell you about my family's history as Japanese immigrants and what that experience has taught me. My, my parents came to Chicago as children. They didn't know each other at the time. They both emigrated here from Idaho, where they had been detained in a Japanese internment camp during World War II. My father f spent his first 13 years on an apple orchard in Oregon, along with his parents and his eight brothers and sisters. My mother spent her first nine years in Seattle with her two siblings, where her parents managed a grocery store. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Executive Order 9066, fueled by public fears, required that Japanese Americans in California, Oregon, and Washington be relocated and detained in camps far enough away from the coast to keep them from aiding and abetting the enemy. Within a couple of months of signing the executive order, my parents and their families lost their homes, farm, grocery store, and friends. They were uprooted and interned in an arid region in south central Idaho. They lived in barracks with their families and shared communal meals with thousands of other internees. The adults worked on irrigation projects 
and farmed, and the children attended makeshift schools. To be released from camps, Japanese Americans were given the option to emigrate to Chicago. Not wanting to raise their children behind barbed wire fences, both sets of my grandparents moved to Chicago with little more than clothes on their back and in their hands. I tell you this story today not to cast a dark and gloomy shadow on this auspicious and celebratory day, but to highlight a few examples of kind, generous, and brave people who had the strength, conviction, and desire to fight the humiliation and injustice that my grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles, and thousands of other Japanese Americans experienced as a result of a federal policy. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, my parents felt like everyone in the U.S. hated them and feared them. However, in camp, they met many people, both Japanese Americans and others, who ignored the concerns and protests of government officials and neighbors and reached out to them for their help. Although my parents rarely talk about their camp experiences, after a 2011 visit to Minidoka Camp in Idaho, my dad remembered a local farmer hiring him and several other young men and boys from the camp to harvest potatoes. My dad recalled feeling a renewed sense of self-worth after receiving a payment for his work, enjoying the freedom of riding in the back of a pickup truck outside of the barbed wire fences. And most nostalgically, he recalled having a bit of fun throwing potatoes at mailbox targets along the road. Beyond the support of individuals, the Religious Society of Friends, also known as Quakers, visited Japanese Americans, first in their homes and later in the camps, to provide moral support. They spoke publicly about the situation and collected food for hungry families. But more importantly, they helped resettle approximately 4,000 college students at more than 600 institutions of higher learning, helping these young people find their way out of the desolate camps and into welcoming academic institutions where they were supported in their pursuit of knowledge and skills. My uncle Walter was one of those lucky 4,000 students. Because of the Quakers' efforts, he was able to enroll in and graduate from Haverford College in Pennsylvania, and then went on to become an internationally renowned nuclear physicist. Sometimes the best response to a bad hand is to win. In order to leave the camps, my grandparents had to secure employment in Chicago. Despite prejudice and fear among many Chicago businesses and their employees, my grandparents and parents were able to leave the camps because Rapon Tools and Edgewater Beach Hotel recognized them as law-abiding, hard-working individuals who deserved a chance. Appreciative of this help and determined to disprove common misconceptions, my grandparents worked hard, established themselves as valuable, dependable, and loyal employees, and challenged their children to make the most of the opportunities available to them in Chicago. Because of their support of their families, their communities, and many brave individuals, organizations, and companies, my parents thrived. They finished high school in Chicago and went to college. My dad even joined the Army and then went to dental school paid by the GI Bill. The farmer and his family, the Quakers, Wrap on Tools and Edgewater Beach Hotel took chances on my family. They had the courage to act. They believed in justice, humanity, and equality. They had the courage to make their community and their country better for all people, in spite of what those in power at the time believed. For that, I am eternally grateful. Have you ever wondered if you would be strong enough to do the right thing when the majority around you do not agree? By choosing the public health field as a profession, you and I have stepped forward and accepted the responsibility to identify existing and emerging unjust, inhuman, and unequal policies, systems, and environments that affect health, and to create solutions to address them. Earlier this year, I was proud to stand with Mayor Rahm Emanuel when he reminded the public that Chicago is a sanctuary city. I was proud to remind my clinic staff and our contracted agencies that we are committed to continuing to provide services regardless of our clients' immigration status, and that we will do whatever we can to prevent them, protect them from discrimination and deportation. And last year, the Chicago Department of Public Health launched Healthy Chicago 2.0, 
a four-year plan focused on improving health by directing resources to those in greatest need by addressing the root causes of poor health, including economic development, housing, transportation, education, and yes, discrimination. This plan requires traditional and non-traditional health partners to combine forces to make bigger, deeper change together. Public health is not the responsibility of government alone. It is the responsibility of all of us. The recently signed Chicago Department of Public Health UIC School of Public Health agreement is a great example of the type of partnerships that we are forging to assure that we accomplish what we set out to do. This partnership will allow CDPH staff and UIC staff and students to share resources, knowledge, and expertise to assure that our work is addressing the public health issues of greatest importance in the areas of greatest need. Now, back to my history lesson. In 1988, more than 40 years after my family was interned, President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act to compensate people of Japanese descent who were incarcerated in internment camps. The legislation offered a formal apology and paid out $20,000 to each surviving victim. Those who supported this act were motiv motivated less by the financial compensation and more by the need for the U.S. government to acknowledge the mistake and to prevent it from being repeated again. And now, as Muslims and members of other religious groups and immigrants from Mexico and other places are being targeted by unfounded prejudice and hatred, it's important to share my family's experience. To make sure that people are aware of the violation of civil rights and inhumanity that can occur when people stay silent. And to make sure that this type of injustice does not occur again. You are here because you worked hard. You are here because you want to make a difference. You are here because you believe in justice, humanity, and equality. But you're also here today because of the hard work of those who stand here with you today. Before you walk across the stage to accept your diploma, take a moment to be proud of your work and your accomplishments. But also take a moment to look at your classmates, your friends, your family, and your professors to acknowledge their support and their contrib contributions to your life. Remember that you needed their help to make it today, and we all need each other's help to make it to tomorrow. With your new bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree in public health, you have a set of tools that uniquely position you to make a real difference, and together we must focus our work on justice, humanity, equity, and health so that everyone has the opportunity to live and to thrive. Now let's get to work. Congratulations.